Welcome to CNM Talk Show. Uh, it's a talk show that is organized by Christ for the Nation Ministries that you follow on Hopa Visual Radio. Start time is 1 and 9. But you can also follow the conversation later. If you miss it, you can follow it on our YouTube channel, Christ for the Nation Ministries. So today, again, I'm with uh, my co-host, Mr. Bruno Irabukunda. I may say hi to you. Yeah, hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. And yeah, hope you enjoy the show. Yeah, so today we have a very interesting topic. We are doing a book review. Um, there are different types of book reviews, and uh, uh, the one we are doing today is a personal big book review where we are going to be sharing the lessons we have learned from the book. As you can see, the conversation is my lifestyle. It's written by Antoine Lutaisile. So um, we'll be doing a personal book review. It's not going to be academic book review, so you do not expect a lot of criticisms for the book, but we will only be sharing our lessons that we have learned from the book. Um, I'm very privileged to be with uh, my friend and my co-host, Mr. Bruno Iradukunda, who is very experienced in two uh, teachings and um, and uh, and interacting with young people, especially on these topics of, uh, especially on the topic of, of forgiveness, but he's also been championing reconciliation among young people. He himself has survived the genocide against Tutsi uh, that was perpetrated in Rwanda in 1994. And he has a lot to share, really, uh, having been working with a lot of people, not just young people, but also many other uh, different people uh, under his organization that he serves, uh, LA Ministries, but also under his other, uh, other uh, endeavors, like his business, like other kinds of uh, talking and uh, speaking that he does in different kinds of settings. So I'm so much privileged. I would like to tell you a little bit about this book. This book is, as we said, uh, called Reconciliation is My Lifestyle. It's a life lesson on forgiving and loving those who have hated you. It was written by Antonio Taisle. The version I have, or the edition I have, the second edition, that was released in 2022. And uh, this version, or this edition, was released under the publishers, Imagine We Publishers. So, um, you can find this book in many of the bookshops in Kigali. Uh, the last time I checked, when I bought this book, it was during his launch, and I bought it at 20,000. So if you have something around that, 20,000 francs, you can easily find the book in any of the bookshops. We also checked on Amazon. Uh, it looked like about 13 US dollars, and you can also buy it from there. So we are going to start. This is a book that I've read, and I think it ranks among the best I've ever read. Um, and from the from the from the uh, the the, the uh, from the title of the book, "Reconciliation is My Lifestyle," uh, the first question that asked that came to my head was, why is it that in the title he says "Reconciliation is My Lifestyle," but then in the subtitle he says "A Life's Lesson on Forgiving and Loving Those Who Have Hated You"? And I would like to start by asking, Mr. Bruno, what do you think is the difference between forgiving for forgiveness or forgiving? And reconciliation. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I would first recommend everyone who is watching uh, to buy the book. It's a very good book and uh, yeah, it's a very high recommended book. And to answer your question, as we said, uh, we'll get from the book but we also give our personal uh, views on different things. Uh, to me, um, the forgiveness is a way to reconciliation. Uh, I wouldn't say reconciliation is the end goal, but I would say uh, forgiveness is the way. Uh, God willingly, it leads to, to reconciliation. Uh, why reconciliation is not, uh, uh, let me say it this, this way. Uh, you don't need to forgive, you don't need to reconcile for you to be able to forgive. So reconciliation should not be the target of your forgiveness, uh, but forgiveness can lead to reconciliation. So you could forgive someone but still not be reconciled with them? Yes. What would, what, what, what would be the cause for that? Uh, because forgiveness is for your own uh, benefit. Okay. It's more, yeah, if we, we look at, uh, of course, uh, we base whatever we say on the word of God. If we look at uh, what Jesus did, if he waited for us to reconcile, he wouldn't have forgiven us. Mm -hmm. If he waited for us to ask for forgiveness, uh, 
he, but the end for him, the heart was that he may reconcile us with the Father. And that's what is also in the book, and that's what uh, our government has been trying to do, that people may forgive, but also reach on that step to reconcile with others. Yes. That's great. Um, so the, 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 the foreword of this book was written by the famous pastor, Pastor Rick Warren. And this is how he starts the book. He starts by saying reconciliation is hard and painful. And he goes on to say, yeah, it is in human nature to avoid hard things, just like water runs into the easiest channels of, uh, of as it flows downhill. He goes, on to, he goes on to say that with many of the good things we pursue, like better health, great knowledge, and honed skills in something, we willingly enter the situation, make the choice, and talk, take on the challenges and troubles. And that's not the same with reconciliation, he says. Most often when the choice to pursue reconciliation is ours, it is because we have been thrust into it against our will. We have been wronged, we have been wounded. Far from welcoming the challenge as a path of improvement, usually we doubt that we could ever return to the condition in which we were wronged. Uh, so looking at these comments, these, 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 uh, the, the, these observations by Pastor Rick Warren, on, uh, they, they are on the uh, page Roman number one, on the forward. Mm. You know, um, I, I believe you are very much experienced in, on the topic of forgiveness. Yeah. And a few times I've heard you talk about uh, reconciliation. Obviously, you being involved into teaching and doing evangelism. I know that our greatest mandate, and just for our viewers again, uh, this talk show is a Christian talk show. Uh, the ministry that sponsors this talk show is a Christian ministry, so we kind of keep going back to the Bible, and, and, uh, and our our views really come from the Bible. Uh, so my, my, my question is, I know that uh, our ministry, or the ministry that Christ has left to us, is to reconcile humanity to God, but also to reconcile humanity to one another. Hmm. So I know that you have already been uh, 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 talking about, very. I have heard you many times talking about forgiveness, but you also touch reconciliation every now and then. And I would like to ask you this. I've heard you people who talk about forgiveness and you always talk about so many benefits from from forgiving mm -hmm. including the the, the 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 benefits that the person who is forgiving receives mm -hmm. by the way this man says in this book he says that reconciliation is even more harder than forgiveness mm -hmm. and while you can stand before people and tell them that once you forgive you're going to benefit from it sometimes it's not the same promise with reconciliation mm -hmm. Because, as he says, uh, starting the journey of reconciliation, there is a chance that you might be hurt again like you were hurt before. Mm. Forgiveness is a different thing. We have explored the topic of forgiveness in our previous talk shows. Uh, it's a, it's a, a different thing. It's, it, once you do it, you can be sure that uh, forgiving others will also help you. Mm. Concession is a different thing. You might start it up and you end up being hurt all over again. My question is, your thoughts about that, but also, why would you encourage people to reconcile with one another, regardless of the possibility that they could hurt themselves again through the process? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I'll answer it referring to, to what uh, Lee Quarren said in his foreword. He said, uh, Antoine's message requires honesty, and the peace of reconciliation is costly. It cost Jesus at the cost, and it cost uh, us to who takes up his, his cross and follow him. We need uh, Antoine's message because those who have walked that hard road can call to us and, and reassure. It's worth it. Keep going. Um, what, what I'm trying to say using Vic uh, uh, Warren's word is that uh, it's a... Uh, being, being for, uh, as we, we said in our previous thought that forgiveness is a journey, it takes us somewhere. So you start, uh, our God is a loving God, and he knows our heart. So he, he can't start by giving you, uh, he can't start by giving a baby a heart born to eat. Mm -hmm. So he, he always knows where to start. And when you allow him to work that journey of forgiveness, then he can take you to the greater level which I may call uh, reconciliation uh, but for him he always has in mind that his people will reconcile with each other that after you have done that step of forgiveness then you can take also 
uh, the step to find your brother because that's what we see in the scriptures. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, so somehow, somewhere, uh, forgiveness is, is is a journey that leads you to reconciliation. Yes. So up to, up to up to now, we have been talking about forgiveness and reconciliation from uh, a general point of view, mm. uh, and you had only tackled the the, the forward by, by by Pastor Rick Warren. So in the introduction, there is remarks that Pastor Antoine uh, uh, brings forth. And uh, before I read them, I would like to introduce our viewers to, 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 to what we are about to start. Because this book is also uh, Pastor Antoine's personal story or journey mm -hmm. of how, uh, how he was able to go through uh, many challenges that has gone through in his life. Of course, there's always uh, highs and lows. And, and he takes us through his journey of, of being hated, of how the hatred also produced hatred in him, and how he healed, he healed from hating those who had, who had hated him and forgave them and reconciled with them. So um, there's, we, we were really going to be also coming back to, to, to our journey as our nation. We are going to be coming back to our history as a Rwanda. We are still uh, in 100 days of commemorating genocide perpetrated against Tutsi in 1994. And part of what we are going to be talking about is really into into that kind of history. And uh, and, and as, I, as I mentioned earlier, we I'm super privileged to be with 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 Bruno, who has not only survived genocide but he has also uh, interacted with many other survivors. He has had different uh, different uh, 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 he spoke at different events. One of the very exciting talks of his that is recent is the one he had on. Uh, uh, on uh, what, what what is this called? The, uh, National prayer breakfast, and he had really a, a, a very nice um, speech, and let me say conversation. He talked about forgiveness. He talked about reconciliation. He talked about his personal story. I hope he will also share with us uh, where we can find such a, a, a speech, um, and then we will enter into 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 the comments into the, into the the the, the, the story of Pastor Antoine Taisley. So where can we find the the conversation? Um, uh, for those uh, who you can find some of the short videos uh, on my on uh, social medias using my name Zirato Kunda Bruno, uh, but uh, others you can just search on YouTube by just putting my name uh, on different uh, YouTube channels. You can find uh, my talks. Oh, that's uh, great. I think I think I think uh, National Prayer Breakfast also has their yes. own YouTube channel, and I think as you scroll, you might you might be able to find uh, his 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 uh, panel, the, the the speech he gave. So let's start with where things start. He, uh, Apostle Tony Tsele, says, and I quote: "I first published Faith. Uh, we are on page eight, mm. Roman number eight. Mm. Says uh, it's in the, in, 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 in the introduction, of course. He says I first published Faith Under Fire." which were testimonies of uh, Christian bravery in 1996. It was a collection of testimonies, both good and bad, of how Christians behaved during genocide. Uh, had God left and failed us? Where was our faith? How could such a thing happen in our country where 90% of the population claimed to be Christians? How could Christians betray and kill, and, and kill each uh, other Christians? So many questions. Processing all the stories I had collected brought a sense of perspective in my life. My final conclusion was that God was with us, weeping with us, inside the genocide, pursuing us, and providing for us in many ways, despite what we were seeing around us. So this is a question that has puzzled so many people. Mm. Um, where a lot of people really get to ask themselves, where was God during the, the genocide? Mm. It's a very tough question. Uh, you ask yourself, God is all merciful, but he was able to see children, babies die, a lot, of young, a lot of young people, old people, mothers, fathers, relatives, and all that. They died, they died during genocide, and one would even get to a point where, they, where you say that they died under God's watch, mm. and he didn't do anything. Sometimes we say anything to mean like, <laughs> he didn't save my family mm. or he didn't save them because they mattered most more, more than me mm. and Antoine makes a conclusion and says that it brought a perspective to him and he says that he understood that he made a, conclu a final conclusion that God was with 
them with well, that God was with us, mm. he was weeping with us, he was rescuing us, and providing for us in so many different ways. I would like to uh, to, to hear your perspective. Uh, I don't know if you have ever asked your question yourself that question too of where God was, mm. and what was your conclusion. Um, I think I'll, I'll agree with uh, with what Doctor said that God was with us, because well, as much as we have uh, had many people who died and uh, who were killed in a terrible way, um, but we have also had stories of people that uh, survived in an amazing way. Um, there's one of the stories that always amazes me uh, of a lady who who saw they were about to kill, and this is a lady that I know, they were about to kill uh, her, her daughter. And then, I don't know if it's trauma or shock. Welcome back. We apologize for the technical issue we had just had, uh, but you're welcome back, and I hope that you, as we go uh, forward, we will not experience many more other issues. So I was asking Bruno to give us his idea of what he has uh, uh, concluded after having had to look back into that painful experience and asking the basic question, the best tough question of where God was. And he had just started to share with us a story of, of, of a friend of his a sister who had also uh, who has also survived. He was sharing us with the story. Would you like go back to the story and tell us what he wanted to the yeah. point and, and share with us the point you tried to make yeah i was saying that god was with us as he still is today with us uh, through the healing and all that uh, i was saying uh, one of the things one of the story that amazed me during the the genocide or the stories of genocide was this lady who saw her daughter being almost being killed uh, it, she was surrounded and then she came from her hiding with uh, her across the what we know as Jitenja in our language so she was covering as if it was bulletproof or it was a, a very special cloth that will stop the Mauritius to come to harm her and her daughter and I think she, she did that out of trauma and uh, out of desperate being desperate not knowing what to do and what is amazing is that 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 reaction uh, was so funny that the guys didn't didn't attack them, but they they kept laughing until they were able to 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 run away from them. And only God can do that. Only God can turn into such a funny uh, thing into something that can save a family. Um, and I've had other people where God spoke to them directly using scriptures that a thousand will fall uh, by your side, but nothing will harm you. And that happened. So the fact that God was speaking to some individuals uh, shows me that God was there. Uh, so you may ask me, so what about the others who, who ended up dying? Uh, I think talking about reconciliation and talking about uh, forgiveness, the, the only way you can get there is to, have God to, to, enable, to allow God to show you his perspective and uh, of course not putting everything on God because we, we know there are two kingdoms and the enemy has his own hand in two things. But uh, uh, you can't forgive if you, you don't see God's perspective uh, where God shows you this happened, but at least those who survived uh, have a plan and they have a purpose for your life and uh, nothing can harm you. Uh, not saying that those who died had finished their purposes, uh, we will find out when we get to heaven, uh, but God had eventually a, a purpose for what happened, and and we can surely say, well, I'm not saying that the success of Rwanda is uh, is because of, the, of what happened, but uh, I believe God was there, and uh, I'm still sure he's still with us, and he's still bringing his healing, and uh, yeah. You know, um, there's this perspective that I like. Obviously, uh, the 1994 genocide against Tutsi uh, was uh, such a very horrific time, and making sense of it might be 
very tough and we might never be able to find all the answers but it's this perspective that I've had people referring to it not to genocide but referring to many other bad worst things that happened to us and what they said is uh, is that uh, and it makes sense to me somehow to some extent uh, they say that um, God has kind of limited himself on the earth mm -hmm. he has limited himself on what he can do on the earth not that he's not able to do it but he has chosen to limit himself and he says that he has given the world or the earth to human beings and therefore almost everything that happens on the earth is is a choice of people uh, of whether they choose to obey God or to obey the devil mm -hmm. and uh, obviously our sins and the sins of people around us will always bring a lot of lots of troubles to us uh, so one might say that um, genocide was a result of disobedience to God right? mm. and I think that's a testament of how far uh, disobedience to God can go into destroying humanity mm. and uh, even though we always say that 90% of the Christians were 90% of the population was Christians there are also Christians who, who do not obey God mm. and when you disobey God whether you are a Christian or not it doesn't change the fact that there is going to be consequences for for, for, for the disobedience and there's definitely going to be to be to be consequences for obeying God and definitely our disobedience usually affects people who are even innocent let me just give an example if you choose to be if a young man like you or myself chooses to be to be to be um, to be lazy and not, not work mm -hmm. my our children are going to suffer not because they have participated in that not because they are not innocent but because you and I have chosen to disobey God whose instruction is you only reap what you sow so um, something that a little bit makes some sense to me when I'm thinking about this question of where God was in 1994 mm. during the genocide that was perpetrated against Tutsi is that I think God was there but he was limited from the too much disobedience to his word that had been going on for over 30 years at the time uh, and was tolerated and I think somehow the devil uh, maximizes the opportunity by by even turning people to blame God for our own disobedience. So uh, that's a perspective. I don't know what you think about that. but um, When I have visitors who are trying to visit uh, the memorial and the, the genocide memorial and, and the museum in the parliament, mm. I always uh, uh, tend to to give them a tour by starting from uh, the former uh, president, uh, President Habjarimana's house. Uh, because when you visit that house, you see how much darkness has taken over, uh, uh, how much this man had given the country to, to, to the power of darkness because they had a shrine in his own home. Uh, he was not, uh, I would say he was into witchcraft. Uh, and when you read the story, you, you hear that he had he had uh, surrendered the country into the hands uh, of uh, of the enemy. And when you see that darkness that is in that particular in that particular home, and then you go to the uh, genocide memorial. Before, before you go to the memorial, the, 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 the genocide memorial, I, yeah. I, I just remember that he had uh, had such a very huge snake. Yeah. I think sometimes snakes are also associated with the powers of darkness. Yeah. I visited the place and that kind of snake was like, what was this guy doing with such a snake? Of all animals that he could have at home, yeah. why is such a big snake? So, yeah, I was just... Yeah, he, he, that, he, it's believed that that snake was given him by his uh, godfather, who, who was uh, Mumbutu. Oh. <laughs> he was uh, mm -hmm. his, like, his spiritual father. So, and uh, knowing a little about him, he was also a man into the dark world and to mm -hmm. uh, uh, that kind of worship. So he was the mentee of a, of a big guy, uh, which also ended bad and who also ended putting uh, his country into uh, big troubles. So I believe every, lead, uh, and that's something we may learn from, uh, from that. When, and that's why we need to pray for our leaders when a leader is not uh, in a good position with uh, with with god uh, he ends up putting 
and the whole country into, into oh, disaster. Yeah. So when you move from that man's house and then you see what, uh, what happened to the country, maybe if you go to Jisozo at the memorial, uh, you can see that the people who did it were possessed. If you, you hear testimonies of many who are in jail now, even them, they can't, they can't understand what they did. So there was this power of the enemy that was at work. Of course, man allowed to, to corroborate and put his hands in. But also when you go to the parliament and you see the, the campaign against the genocide, you see how much God was able to use few people who mm -hmm. said I'm available to, to liberate my country. Uh, it's amazing. If you see it in that perspective, then you can see God at work. You can see, you can't tell me how much six, 600 people, even less, because some were already injured and some were already politicians, they were not uh, uh, in, uh, active in the, in the army. So you can't tell me how much 600 people surrounded by the so many army barracks, uh, presidential guard being in few meters uh, from them, you tell me they were able to liberate the whole country. It, there was definitely God uh, helping them. And if you hear their stories, it was a miracle after a miracle. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. Um, of course, uh, without God, m man cannot do anything. Uh, but I have a friend who likes to say that, uh, but also the word of God also says about it. He says, uh, God has put his name above his word. So if God has given man his word above his name. Yeah, his word above his name, sorry. Uh, if God has given man the world, uh, then he can't violate what he said. If man chooses to do evil, um, God is not pleased with him, but he always has a plan. He always finds a way to rescue man. So I, I believe uh, God was there, and through that story you can see him. Yeah, yeah. that's true. That's very true. Um, you know, there are different ways to look at the story of the of our nation's tragedy, mm. uh, the 1994 genocide against Tutsi. And um, when you start in the middle, what I mean, if you start anywhere, if you start in 1990s, or if you start in 1994, you're actually starting in the middle of the genocide. Uh, if genocide, as it's called, it's a killing. Or, or trying to destroy a general or, 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 or a kind or a type of people, then I think it's right to say that the genocide started in 1959. Mm -hmm. So, um, Antoine's, Antoine's story does not start in 1959. It starts a little bit earlier. And because it starts a, bit, a little bit earlier, it starts with so many good stories. In fact, mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to tell you the stories. You've got to buy the book and read them <laughs> yourself. Yourselves, but um, there's a lot of things that he talks about. We are now in chapter one, so he talks about a lot, a lot of things, a lot of beautiful things about his family. He mentions about his uh, his brother's names. If you would like to know him better, you've got to buy this book. And he talks about how uh, when he was born, growing up, how his mother would uh, would tell them the stories what we traditionally call imigani. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he takes us through the stories. There are two very good jokes that i've read in the book <laughs> i'm not sharing with you today you've got to buy the book and read them yourselves uh one of which is he he, he paints his father's puppy mm -hmm. so <laughs> when i was reading the the story I, I i looked at the man that i know he is today that i admire and then imagined him when he was that young mm -hmm. and painting his father's puppy <laughs> the rest is <laughs> the rest you can find in the book <laughs> but so he starts with such a very um beautiful story of how life was his father being a businessman mm. and then on uh, on on page six he has a very s short statement in the middle of page six and he says the beginning of troubles mm. that's when you kind of tell yourself am i am i ready <laughs> <laughs> so he starts talking about how 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 um he started hearing the, the the different kind of people coming to his to, to, to his father's house talking about things of uh, of 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 of, um, of fleeing to Uganda and later in the second chapter he talks about how the events that he's describing are between 1960 
to 1963, 65 mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, 63 or 64. We'll we get there and we'll see. Mm -hmm. And then he describes what happened to his father. Uh, maybe if I was if I, to read a few statements, he says, the mob of our neighbors, that's page nine, mm -hmm. say the mob of our neighbors swarmed on top of him. That's his father. They had just found him at home. They, they swarmed up on top of him, beating him with the sticks and clubs. Some of them came inside the house. One took the food we were eating and threw it outside. They took the tin mugs of milk. Mom, mom had just poured for us and spilled them all over the ground. We nestled onto our mother's side and stayed with her. Remember at this time, Pastor Antoine is very young. Mm -hmm. I think at the time he had not even started school yet. Or if he had started school, he was still in the in the in the in the primary school so he's describing the the things that are happening to such a young kid and he does not make sense of it because he's too young he's trying to make sense of what's going on why are they attacking his father and all that and they, they, they did not only attack his father but they also abused not raped but insulted his mother mm. uh, and he says that one of the mob members said Get out of our way, you bitch, and take out your puppies with you. The puppies, of course, he referred it to, the, to his children. Mm -hmm. So they lashed out to give weight to those who were plundering uh, their valuables. They plundered their house. They took things out of the house, choosing what to take and break to pieces what they did not, uh, what they did not want. Before long, their home looked like ruin, and all their possessions were either taken or broken. So he makes remarks on page 11 and he says once a wealthy family he had become poor mm -hmm. and our lives had and their lives had to be built as his father slowly recovered and peace finally sort of returned but he also goes on to share the story of how one day his father goes in his long businesses and he does not return and during that time this is what he's thinking he's thinking uh, that on page 11 the last paragraph he says I even know maybe if we start a little bit uh, on the previous paragraph he says I always wondered why our neighbors had done that to us why did they beat my father why did they destroy and take our possessions why did that man want to kill us with his nail spiked club mixed feelings stirred in my heart a jumble of fear and hatred for those people I even started thinking that the day I grow up and become strong enough I would avenge my father as heroes did in some of the stories mom told us at night. Uh, before I go to him now talking about his worries, I would like to ask you, do you can you relate that, that, that situation of uh, the people I had, maybe for you when you were born or trying to make sense of things, at least you kind of was born when the hatred had already started going on, so mm -hmm. uh, somehow you already knew that there was, there was something wrong with Tutsis in this government, in this system. But I know you listen to a lot of stories, your mm -hmm. parents, your friends, and all others. Uh, how do they relate to Antoine's story? Uh, I think for um, these guys who are older, uh, I think for them they experienced uh, things that we cannot even imagine with our kind of mind. Um, because being uh, like as we asked about stories, uh, if you hear guys who were at school, um, not only in, even in Rwanda, even in Burundi, those who went to study there, uh, they, they could get their grades and divide them into two because of who they are. And for some of them didn't know why. They later found out when they, they grew up because they you know when you have done your exams and you know you have nailed it, you mm -hmm. know it. Yeah, yeah. So when you expect 90 and then you say you have 45 and you can't see anything wrong, you have done just because of who you are, your grades are, uh, there is that seed, as this chapter is called, uh, there is that seed of hatred that is being sown. Um, and which I think that's what the Bel the, the Belgians wanted. Uh, to separate the Rwandese uh, from all angles. I, um, I was once told that this, uh, their plan or this propaganda was very well uh, strategized and 
put in place. They had put in plan something that would be of more than 200 years. Uh, so they knew what they were doing, even, even at school, even this kind of hatred that was being sown uh, in the young generation. Because when you see your mother being uh, insulted, like what he said towards the end of this chapter. We are now worried about... Hmm? He says, I'm now grown up and ah. I've had time to process all those... <laughs> So, uh, welcome back. We have just experienced another uh, technical issue, um, but it's now been settled. So, again, we were listening to Bruno's uh, uh, um, um, relation to this story, and he was explaining to us a little bit about history and about how Belgians had a much bigger plan for over 200 years to destroy our communities and all that. Uh, I think you may continue from there and continue to share with us. Yeah, I was saying that this is something that was really planned well and uh, and that's why we come in as a young generation that we ne really need uh, uh, to be aware so that this, uh, let me call it a bitter root uh, of the seed that was thrown, uh, sown into the Rwandese uh, may not grow into us because uh, at least for Taisire, uh, as I was sharing you uh, behind the camera, that uh, I love what he says that I'm now grown up and I've, ti I've had time to process all the sad events and I've succeeded, uh, exercised my demons. I no longer feel the anger wearing inside me when I remember my past. But this is something that only Jesus can do. Uh, no man can remove those bad uh, uh, feelings and uh, I if you get a chance to watch this I want to uh, to comfort him if I may say because he ends up saying that that he's worried and I've heard him saying this over and over uh, be it on the panels a bit in his speeches that he's worried about the young generation uh, who have seen their parents being massacred and uh, uh, who, who have seen their father killing their mothers, or have seen worse uh, things. There are, there are those who have seen priests killing people. There are those seen. Can I read this statement and then you comment yes. on it? Because I want I want people to to capture it. Yeah. This is a person Antoine saying. I am now worried about. I'm quoting. Yeah. I'm now worried about our younger generation. Many have seen their parents massacred. Some have even seen their fathers killing their mothers. Almost all our young adults in their late 20s and 30s have seen or heard somebody being killed. Some have even been encouraged to take part in killings. And I wonder, will they all heal from these memories? So you can go on. What, what were you trying to... You were trying to comfort Pastor Antoine with his yeah. worries about this. Yeah, um, I'm trying to, to comfort, uh, of course, uh, uh, past time, but also the many parents who are worried, uh, who are saying, "Will our kids be ever be healed?" Um, I will not say we 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 all be healed, but uh, I would say uh, you can't imagine how much grace God has on us. Uh, the way He, because it's more, it, it's more than what you can imagine. What God is doing in the young generation, those who have allowed Him to work in their heart. Uh, so don't be worried, uh, we will be healed in Jesus' name. But uh, um, also we need to continue to pray uh, because this burden is real. Uh, he's saying he's worried because he, he feels the burden. Uh, the, uh, the man that killed, one of the guys that killed many people uh, in the genocide, when he was arrested, uh, he was asked, why 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 did, did you, you kill uh, so many people mm. and uh, his response was uh, uh, do you know how many years we carried them and he was referring to the kings mm -hmm. and uh, this guy was uh, 
1715 towards uh, during the genocide, meaning he was born in the 70s, 80s, and 79. So you would wonder uh, which king was there in, in the 79. Uh, so uh, if a seed is sown, it can be, it can grow and uh, reflect many, many things. But the, the young generation after the genocide, as he referred to in his book, the, tw the ones in the 20s and the 30s, uh, which is our generation, um, God is healing us, and we are some of some of us don't even know the difference between us unless we speak about it. Uh, but I don't know if I'm getting old, but I'm also getting I'm also worried about the younger generation between the 20s, uh, the people who were born in the 2000s, uh, going, going on, because for them they don't even want to know. This is a topic that they don't want to talk about, and this is something that is part of our history. And we said that if you want to know where you're going, you should know where you're coming from. Uh, so um, parents who are praying also pray, remember those, that young generation, but also to tell the young generation that this is not something to ignore. This is something that you all need to have information about it, not to be sad or not to be, how can I say, uh, harsh and have hatred, but to know it about the information so that when someone brings a wrong information, we can easily detect it. Yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you so much. Um, on the note you've just finished on, uh, in the second chapter, uh, on page 23, he says something mm -hmm. that relates to what you were just saying, and I think uh, I would love to hear your comment about it. The second chapter is uh, is titled uh, Stolen Childhood, Stolen Laughter. Mm -hmm. He shares his stories of how uh, his childhood was stolen, mm -hmm. uh, his father dies, and he, he's that young, and in, that kind of, in those kinds of communi communities, uh, fathers really did a lot of things a lot of uh, i mean the, the the entire finances and livelihood of homes depend on them mm -hmm. so he does that that uh, that early early time when Antoine is still young yeah. and he shares stories of how he grows up to become uh, a person that keeps everything to himself uh, he does a lot of work that he had never done before he starts to do a lot of things he talks about how he would go to school earlier and come back and come back running so that he, so he talks about how you he, he kind of started running a lot he would go to school running and he would come back running and he truly goes deep and i uh, that's why i still recommend the book we are going to, to, to recommend the book throughout the the entire review uh, because there's a lot of stories in here that no one can read for you but you've got to read them for yourself uh but then on the comment that you just made there's this thing that he says on page 3 and he says people mm. often claim that time heals all wounds mm. and that anger and bitterness will die off with the years mm. and he challenges that saying and he says but it does not work that way anger and hatred are like mud thrown into clean water mm -hmm. the water may eventually clear and recover its color but even the slightest motion stealing, stealing up the bottom will quickly show that the mud is still down there, influencing and clouding its composition. When kept inside, anger does not disappear with time, it turns into bitterness and subtrains your whole outlook on life and your perception of other people. So, uh, you were talking about how uh, lots of our age mates do not, uh, who have experienced some of these things uh, do not want to revisit the things. Mm. Um, they don't want to talk about it and all that, and then the next generation, people who are, who come after us, people who were born in the their two thousands and later, they don't even want to visit these these stories. Mm. And I think somehow we are tricked to think that that's that's what's better, that's what's uh, what's what's uh, safer. Mm. But it looks like Pastor Antoine challenges that, and he says that we have got. Like he said in the previous comment that you read, mm -hmm. to exercise our to exercise our own demons, we've got to face this history. We've got to go and learn about it, and find out where do we stand vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. this 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 history, and what conclusions do we make, uh, depending on where we stand 
in this history and be able to truly but, but, but of course go to visit i love the i love the the, the 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 i don't know if it's called slogan the slogan of our country during commemoration they say mm -hmm. we remember uh in, in, in kiyarwana it says mm -hmm. in english they say remember new and rebuild mm -hmm. right, is that right Reunited. but in kiyarwana if i was translated the chinona words into english uh, they are talking about we remember and we rebuild mm -hmm. So I think when we remember the genocide perpetrated against Tutsi with the intention of rebuilding, mm. after remembering what has happened to you or to your family or to your neighbors or to, I mean, after reviewing where you stand vis-a-vis -vis the, the history, mm -hmm. with an intention of rebuilding, you ask yourself, you make conclusion, you ask yourself, where do I stand? How can I make my conclusion? How, I mean, I mean how can I make my contribution and all that? So what do you think about this analogy, which is, to me, is an awesome analogy, but also kind of uh, go back into what you are trying to explain and I think this kind of knowledge kind of helps you to explain better what you are trying to, expl to explain about our generation and the, uh, and the generation after us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, recently someone told me that this generation is uh, uh, it's called no stress. Um, they use the Kinyarwanda word saying uh, um, and, uh, and I think that's very bad um, because to see it and get angry it's not bad because anger is an emotion from God so uh, you can't avoid everything that makes you hung angry you know you can't avoid them anything that everything that makes you emotional um, so regarding uh, the history I'll, I'll show you a practical way that how this thing is very dangerous uh, the young generation of people who committed uh, genocide, uh, those who fled to, to Zaire, which is uh, the current DRC, uh, for them they had told them that uh, RPA, uh, they were not people. Mm -hmm. uh, they were these insects with uh, long ears uh, that they w once they get you, they cut you into two uh, and they give you your own meat to eat. Uh, it was, uh, they, they used to tell them terrible stories. And the reason why they believed these stories is because they were ignorant and they didn't want to know uh, about what RPA was about and what uh, uh, was happening in the country. Yet we had radio like Mohabura, we, ha we had uh, other radios, of course, uh, El Terem was one of the biggest and which was spreading the, uh, the yeah the false information but if they had wanted all the information it was easy to get they could have uh, easily got the information and the true information but because they didn't want to know uh, they they wanted to stay ignorant uh, it made them believe the wrong information which led them some of the young people uh, to be part of the, the genocide and the killings. So uh, to the young generation, um, please be informed, not only on the history of the genocide, but also on the history of Rwanda. We have an amazing story. We have uh, amazing stories uh, when it comes to kings and when it comes to uh, how Ra a kingdom became a big kingdom. So I think we have better story than the telenovelas that we all mm -hmm. watch, than the series we all watch. And uh, I encourage also people in the, in the filmmaking industry to, uh, to focus on our story. I think they can make better movies than the ones they are making if uh, they focus on the story of Rwanda. So young generation, please uh, try to, uh, to invest so much time in our own history so that we may not be fooled again and that's a way of reconciliation and that's a way that we may say never again nev the genocide will never happen in rwanda again because you'll be having uh, good information yeah yeah um, it's really amazing uh there's something you mentioned about uh f going back into the history and you actually get angry and you say that uh, being angry is not is, is not a problem mm -hmm. the problem is what you do with that anger so uh, since we are still in the uh, in the first chapters of the book, 
uh, as we are telling you, the, 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 the chapter we are about to finish is called The Bitter Seeds of Hatred. So he's sharing about how, no, 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 no. The, the, the chapter we are on is chapter two, which says story in childhood, story in laughter. Mm. And uh, he talks about his childhood and all that. And then chapter three, he talks about how he was rooted into hatred. And there, uh, the, the last uh, statement that he makes in chapter two, that's on page 24, the same with the same, uh, and also the, the, the last paragraph on the chapter 3, uh, that's page, page 37. I would want us to first read those words and then uh, we'll talk about them. Uh, page 24 on the last statement, it starts with, I often, I don't know if you're there yet, yes, I'm says, there. I often dreamed of an opportunity when I would be able to do something big, something that could hurt these people and make them weep, weep as many tears of sorrows as I often did. And then on page 37, he says, I have never offended any of them. So why would they want to kill me? Mm. And the conclusion always came clear and unambiguous. The conclusion would be, they are simply bad and wicked from the core. They are born murderers. Mm. I know you, uh, you yourself survived the genocide. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you, you have friends and you have interacted with young people who survived genocide who were born from the families of, 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 of genocide survivors. And um, I wonder if, okay, I wonder if, I, I, I know what I know. I know that somehow uh, when you look into the history as we are saying, you mm -hmm. could easily come back into this kind of anger uh, and, and tell yourself this was not fair. Mm -hmm. This was not fair. Um, shouldn't have happened to us. Why did these people do these things to us? We had not harmed them. We had not done anything. The, the story you just mentioned earlier of, of this 15, 16 year old mm -hmm. man who, uh, during 1994 who said that they had carried mm -hmm. the kings, yet he was born uh, uh, under the presidency of Wabi Ariman, who was a Hutu. And, uh, and, and you're kind of sharing of how uh, the, 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 this guy it really got so I'm much angry with the propaganda that was going on, mm -hmm. telling him about how Hutu, how to are bad from the core. Uh, and also, it could be that once you go into the history and you look at how fam your, your family was destroyed, how much uh, devastation went on into your own mm -hmm. uh, parents and siblings and all that, you could easily come to the same conclusion that Anto Antoine had at the, at the time and say, mm -hmm. um, I dream of making this fair by, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, doing to them what they have done to me, that's the only way that it is fair. And you ask yourself, why would the people do these things to us when you have done nothing wrong with them? Mm -hmm. And maybe you may come to a conclusion that uh, uh, they are simply bad and wicked from the core, and they are born murderers. So I would like to ask you, what would you say to a person that thinks like this? What would you say to a person that for really fair assessment he would say, there's no any other way that I would explain what they have done to us except saying that probably it's part of their nature to be bad people. What would you say to that such a person? Or how do you usually, when you're having a conversation with, uh, with uh, young people mm. who might be tempted to think like this, what do you usually tell them? Um, this may, may surprise many people, but I would say uh, they are not far from the truth. Uh, because uh, uh, the Bible says, and as we said, we refer ourselves to the Bible, uh, says we are all born under um, Adam. Uh, so we are all born sinners. So we have that nature of, of sin in us. Mm -hmm. um, it's not uh, an ethnic group. It doesn't have to be a particular family or group of people that is born murderers and sinners. We are all born uh, sinners, uh, but uh, it, it, it what you feed is what grows so having been fed um, genocide propagandas and uh, uh, wrong information it made their carnal nature grow uh, and it, they became the demons we saw they became the monsters we saw and 
we can't throw stones at them because if they put you in their position, you may even do worse things than they did. If, uh, uh, if you're fed, if your beliefs uh, are fed constantly from morning to evening, uh, and I don't, uh, there's something that uh, we, we always look at these guys, but when you look at even the survivors, after the genocide, uh, we had the same ideology. We had we, we thought all, all Hutus are, are killers. Uh, we were taught at our homes, don't don't join them when you are you are playing. Uh, don't play with these guys because they are they are killers. So a young a young boy at your age, or even a smaller at your age, you would see him. Or her as a as a Hutu, as someone who can kill you, even though they are not as strong as you are, or even if they are so sweet and good. But for you, because of what you've been fed, because you know where he or she is born from their family, then you see her uh, in that uh, length of saying, "This is a Hutu, so she or he may kill me." So uh, I would say we, we are all sinners. It's a matter of what we are fed, and I will come back to what we, we, we've been saying. It's our responsibility now to, to change our mindset. Uh, Romans 12 says we should ha renew our minds, our minds. Uh, and that's a, a very big, I wouldn't say it's not, it's not hard. But it's a big responsibility as Rwandis, as a young generation that we have uh, to renew our mind. And uh, as uh, I like to say, and it's probably going to become my, my slogan soon, uh, <laughs> and uh, focus on the positive vibe, which is reconciliation, which is forgiveness, which is unity, and building our country. You know, I have a perspective about this and I would like to hear what you think about it. And uh, my perspective about this is, um, there's this Kiyaronda saying that says, uh, mm -hmm. kind of saying that if you target the bad people, you may end up killing even the good ones. And uh, recently I was watching uh, a, a, a genocide survivor's testimony, a famous news reporter Jean Lambert Gattari and he says something that was that really made a lot of sense to me. He says that uh, that uh, um, um, obviously people who committed genocide they are guilty that's for sure uh, they were bad just like you said they appeared to be demons uh, but it's wrong to think that uh, to, to always refer to our our, 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 to always refer to collective identity before uh, personal identity. Mm -hmm. uh, the Agatha's, the, 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 the national hero, mm -hmm. uh, former prime minister, Wigiman Agatha, mm -hmm. and some other people, there are some Hutus who stood up against the genocide. So mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be wrong to say that just because the majority of the people, the majority of the masses, uh, committed genocide that it's going to be the guilt I, I mean that it's going to be that the entire uh, ethnic group is bad people yet there are some that actually uh, were in their right senses and they oppose the genocide and as we are saying I think as we look forward to the future I think it's good to always look at each individual you know uh, person that I said that we are talking about he said something some time back and he was talking about um, I don't remember who asked him uh, would he let his daughter get married to a Hutu mm. and he gives a very good perspective he says he, says, he looks at well, that's my analysis of what he says but it's kind of like he looks at the Hutus in two ways there are those who are intoxicated by genocide ideology mm -hmm. and he says such a Hutu I would not give my daughter to him but a Hutu with a changed mind mm. I mean with out genocide ideology mm -hmm. i wouldn't worry at all to give you my daughter and i think as we are saying my, my perspective on all this is that as a new generation it's good for us to sit down have these conversations 
uh, talk about where we come from, talk about our history, talk about what we went through, mm -hmm. and then make some sense out of it, and, and, and really challenge ourselves to be a united country from today and, and in the future. Uh, and I think that starts from being able to have a conversation with you. If I am so much afraid of you, if I'm so much of a, afraid of, of, of uh, any individual, it becomes very complicated. Mm -hmm. But if we could sit down and listen to you, and you listen to me, and we talk about some of these things in an open kind of way, mm -hmm. and we confront these pasts of ours, and we understand, and I understand you and you understand me, even if, even if we might be coming from different backgrounds, it kind of builds a bridge for people to start from and build our future if you look at the strategy that the government of unit used mm -hmm. they didn't kind of discriminate every hutu after they had taken power mm -hmm. you know the other day i was listening to 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 general retired kamari james uh i think it was doing uh the burial of uh, of late general gutsins by said and he says that uh, uh they were in the army and this guy, who happened to be a Hutu, was given the rank of a full general before they were given the rank. And, and I think he's trying to convey a message that it's called the government of unity for a reason. Mm -hmm. They didn't choose to subscribe to the hatred and divisionism that was that they found in the country that had actually driven them out of out of the country. They mm -hmm. chose to go beyond all that and look at the individuals they are gen they, 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 they are soldiers that we are fighting with they are people they are hutus they are members of the ethnic group that had committed genocide that we are prosecuting mm -hmm. but still they chose that those who had not incriminated themselves who had not participated who had something to offer they gave it them a chance to offer and i think somehow uh why would my perspective on all this and what i would say to to, to our generation and the younger generation is that uh, as we move forward Let's be able. Let's be interested in one another. Let us be interested in, in knowing, what does Bruno has to offer, regardless of his ethnic background. Mm -hmm. uh, how can I help him? How can he? How can he help me? How can we work together and all that? And I think, if we ever subscribe to a collective identity, like the government uh, emphasizes, let's subscribe to a collective identity of being the Rwandans. Mm -hmm. uh, if we choose to think about our background of which we cannot ignore, let's think about it. But again, as I meet you, before I look at you as a Hutu or as a Tutu or as a Twa, let me first look at Bruno. Who is Bruno? Mm. What is him? What is he got to offer? What's the content of his character? Like, uh, let Dr. Uh, 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 um, what was his name? Martin Luther King Jr. said. Let's look. Let's judge people according to the character of their, uh, the content of their character mm. rather than where they come from. And I think. It helps. It helps to know what do you think about all this that have happened to our country. What's your new perspective? Mm -hmm. Have you renewed your mind, just like you are saying? And and, and, and really, it's helpful because <laughs> we will see the words that President Kagame said when they were commissioning the the the, 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 the reconciliation commission, and he said that this country cannot move on mm -hmm. unless we are reconciled. So that was my uh, my two cents. If you have some thoughts about it, you can share. Uh, uh, re regarding that, mm. um, um, I don't think the word I was about to use is the right one, but the person that uh, saved my life during the genocide was uh, someone who the history calls the Hutu, uh, who was our maid. and. Uh, shows my own rescue and uh, wherever she is I, I thank her and because she saved my life she carried me on her back uh, most of the days of the genocide and she could go around the, ro the roadblocks freely because she had the idea of a Hutu and uh, she could move freely she, she was not being uh, hunted down so uh, the word I was afraid to say to use is to say my hero in the genocide is her, but uh, on a personal level, that's her because mm -hmm. she she was able to save my life. Uh, so, I wouldn't, and I have many stories of uh, of uh, Hutus that uh, saved the, that were took responsibility of people during the genocide and they were able to save their lives. Uh, so I. I 
me personally, I don't think uh, all Hutus are, are murderers. And um, yeah, I think it's what the history really called us. Uh, even regarding the nose thing, saying that someone has a bigger nose and that's a Hutu and someone has a, a small, a small nose. nose and that's a Tutsi. Uh, you'll be surprised if you saw my, my uncles because they have they, they, they have grown and uh, <laughs> I'm going to say fat, but <laughs> they, they have uh, they have added weight, mm. and uh, every part of their body has added weight. So if you look at their pictures when they were my age, they looked like me. But now when you look at them, uh, they look different. They look different because they they have they have added weight and their nose has added weight too. So if you look at them with those glasses of saying if someone has a bigger nose, mm -hmm. uh, he's a Hutu, and if he has a smaller nose, he's a Tutsi, you will be mistaken. And that applies to many people today that uh, you would mistakenly uh, call them what they are not. And, uh, and if you look at people who, who committed genocide, if you, you have to look at the nose, uh, I've, see, uh, I've seen handsome men who committed <laughs> <laughs> who committed genocide. Some of them really, if they put them there and they ask you who do you think he is, you'd say this is a this is a Tutsi. So as uh, as at the beginning of this gr this book, it showed us how the groups were mm -hmm, formed. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with the uh, with the family or. Uh, it's a choice that people made, uh, and if you are still making that choice, and mm. then you belong to <laughs> to that kind of group. But for us who have made that good choice of reconciliation and uh, and rebuilding our country, then we are Rwandans. And if you have made that choice of uh, having that ideology, I would then say that you are Hutu, a Twa, or a Tutsi then you are an enemy of this country. Mm -hmm. So we are either Rwandan or we are either the enemies of, uh, of Rwanda. So there is no ethnic group. Mm. Uh, yeah. So um, let's go back to the book. Yes. Uh, and uh, we are now in chapter four. Mm. And uh, on page 45, he says something that I would like us also to reflect on. He says, and I quote, this was a system, a rotten system, too big for any individual to change or even to challenge on his own. I knew there was nothing I could do and that helplessness in itself made my heart sick. I often reflected this is how people grow into labels, terrorists and suicide bombers. They are tired of a system, fed up with simply surviving in hopelessness. They do not hate individuals, they hate the system and anybody associated with it. And such characters grow a plenty in the uh, in the fertile soil of dead hopes crushed under the weight of unjust and oppressive system. Uh, in this chapter, he called it higher and deeper. He's also sharing about growing up uh, at school, being being like share, the, the, one of the stories you, you were sharing of how people used to lose their marks simply because of where they, where, where they were born. So he talks about how he goes into the seminary school supposed to be a Christian, a Christian environment but even there they are not treated as human beings and all that and now he talks about the system and I w maybe also from the point we had just mentioned uh, of, of, of what kind of system that uh, our country went through and also I think it's a high time that we need to truly um, thank God for this new system mm -hmm. because I think it's amazing to have that U-turn from a past in which uh, the, the only thing that it really uh, came forward before anything else was who are you uh, and it was written down in our national ideas yeah. and, 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 and before someone even gives a chance to listen to you it would be like you to say you who to if you're a tutsi you're a snake and all that mm -hmm. and that's that was a very bad system as he as, as he mentions but I think, I, I think we've got to thank God for a new system because today uh, everybody goes to school and people compete fairly, not just in schools, but also in business, in politics, mm. in every level of our, of our lives. And I think this is also a message to outsiders who have never been in Rwanda, who are always told that uh, the system is even worse mm. than what it was in 1995. I think they should come and visit Rwanda and 
and look for themselves and and interview people mm. and talk to people and hear listen to stories yeah. because when you listen to the stories of our parents and how they were how they survived the system and look at the system that we were born into i think we stand a chance yeah. but it's also a big responsibility upon us mm. since we were, because uh, as we say the bible says to whom much is given much is expected yes having be, been born into this new system uh into a system that does not discriminate us that does not uh divide us against each other mm. it's a it's a it's a such a big blessing but it's also a big responsibility i don't know what your thoughts are about the two different kinds of systems that we have that we had the, the, the first system you had in place and then the system that we have today um uh, first of all I'll, uh, thank the current government um because uh, sometimes they tell you the stories of things they they did and you think it's a it's a fiction or it's a it's a lie mm. but uh, i really um I think what was done before, the discrimination and all that, um, there was there was sowing something. Uh, I like the scripture that is uh, is used on this chapter, the introduction of this chapter, that seed to eat, that that seed. Uh, let the me bitterness. The bitter. Let me read it for you in uh, in another version, in uh, easy to read uh, version. It says, "Be careful that no one fails to get." God's grace. Be careful that no one loses their faith and becomes like a bitter weed growing among you. Someone like that can ruin the whole group. Um, so be careful that no one commits, uh, uh, it goes on to say, other sins, but that is related with the, uh, with murder and all that. So what I want to say is this. Uh, it's, uh, it's God's grace, first of all. Mm -hmm. When I look at our president, um, I don't see, I, do, <laughs> I don't think that uh, it's his own, it's by his strength that he does what he does. He's a good man, I uh, so much respect for him, but I believe there is also God's grace uh, to have so much power and still choose to, to reconcile, still choose to, to see people the same. So I believe there is uh, God's grace, and that's why people uh, really need God, because if he didn't have uh, God in him, he would have done differently. But also, uh, coming back to what we said earlier, of us being Rwandese, uh, living alone, us having God in us, but as Rwandese, we are regarded as noble people, and uh, a noble person does not discriminate. A noble person uh, loves everyone and... Uh, considers everyone the same so i would say it's a it's a good thing that the government is doing and uh, let's keep it and uh, the next generation should learn from them and also eliminate the re the little that is remaining uh, this is my 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 call to to the young generation i know there are some people who still have that ideology where you go to look for a job or to apply and they ask you, where are you from? Or when they're congratulating you that they have given you a job and they say, ah, if you had been a different uh, person from this tribe, then you could not have qualified for this job. Uh, I know it's very hard to get a job nowadays, mm -hmm. but if you get a job uh, because of who you are, not your qualification, uh, I'd say think twice, <laughs> because uh, mm -hmm. if you if you keep entertaining those thoughts, mm -hmm. uh, the the weed that we are talking, the bitter weed, uh, will keep growing. So let's be uh, intention in eliminating uh, mm -hmm. these thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the end of this chapter, I would like us to take uh, a short break. Uh, maybe she will help us with. Uh, there's this King Aranda song that says Murimbe we take her by Eme Wimana So when we take a break we can play it But before we take a break let's go through chapter 5 mm. And uh, so so far we are talking about Antoine's story Pastor Antoine uh, Taisile's story And up to this point he had actually not met God He had not become a Christian yet mm. So it's in this chapter that he becomes a, Christians, yeah. a, a Christian it, it was after he had been uh, moved from his position 
lecturing at university and he's been moved to to, to, to teach in Rino in a high school and he's even taken into a lower high school. You know, mm. in Rwanda we have two two levels of high school. We have what we call ordinary level, that's from senior one to senior three, and advanced level from senior four to senior six. And I, if I recall the story well that I read here, he had been moved and he was actually put in the lower level, ordinary mm. level. And when he's there, he reads the Bible. This is a story that you should find in the book. Once you buy the book, you can read the story. It's a very interesting story of how he meets God while reading the Bible. Reading the Bible not because he's bored, because of all that. And he's such a good storyteller. <laughs> I love the story when he talks about how he sat in the in, in the forest. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting story that I think you guys should go on and read. But as he reads the story, as he, he has become a Christian and has given him his life to Christ, on page 55, he confronts something that I've also confronted many times. That I, you know, I know many Christians have confronted, especially those who have been challenged to forgive. Mm. Uh, and he makes remarks. He says, on page 55, maybe I could start a little bit above. Um, uh, and, and, and I will quote, but the, 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 when I get the part that I want us to to comment about and then I will, I, will, I, will, I will mention that too from the the, the, the app from the top of the of, of the of the page he says my mind flashes back to 1963 I see my father surrounded by the mob I now don't know where I am my anger is gaining momentum at every step by the time we reach the cross I am in a fury and words escape from my mouth loud and audible these Hutus how long will they do this to innocent people? I cried out. All of a sudden, I am back to my senses and I remember that this is not Rwanda, but Judea. Judea. I read on, but deep inside me, so he's reading the Bible and he's reading the story of Jesus. And of course, uh, he goes through the story of how Jesus comes from, uh, I mean, he goes to, 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 to Jerusalem and he goes through the whole story of how he gets to the cross. Mm -hmm. So he's... When he's going through that and relating it to himself, he was also he was also going through all the troubles he had gone through, all the uh, all, all the hatred that had been done mm -hmm. against him and his family. So this is him reflecting, and he goes on to say, um, uh, "I read on, but deep inside me, something has happened, and I am unable to keep my distance from the story anymore. When Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing." I again loudly exclaim, no. So this is the part I wanted mm. to comment about. He says, no, no, no. You cannot pray like that for these unfaithful people. Lord, how do you dare pray like that for these people? When they were hungry, you fed them. Mm. When they were sick, you healed them. And when their children were dead, you raised them. And here they are chanting, crucify him. Sneering and insulting, repaying, repaying evil for good. How do you dare? You should cast them. Mm. I think this is a story that uh, lots of genocide survivors, and we keep referring to genocide survivors because we we, we are commemorating the 1994 genocide against Tutsis. Mm. But obviously, lots of people, not just genocide survivors, also people who came from outside the Rwanda, people who had been forced out of country in 1959, they also suffered their big... Mm -hmm. uh, portion of trouble and they also have to, conf to, to confront forgiveness mm -hmm. in one way or the other mm -hmm. so there is forgiveness in all kinds of ways but uh, we have chosen now to focus on the genocide survivors mm -hmm. and I've had lots of stories from different people who have survived genocide and they tell you how they looked at people mm -hmm. that they had grown up with they had played football with that they had shared food, they had, you know, done a lot of, they, they, they actually had good memories with. Mm. And sometimes as they come to attack them, uh, some of, some members of the, of, of the, the inner harm, they come to attack them, mm. it looks at this person, is like, bro, the other day, you know, you were hungry, we shared a meal, the other day you were sick, my mother is a doctor, he treated you, mm. and all these kind of things go through. And Antoine is also reflecting, he's looking at Jesus, how comes? Mm. So this this sense of being such a victim, as being killed in such a very, uh, very ugly let me use the word ugly way, uh, uh, and this story of Jesus I know that it relates to so many 
genocide, genocide survivors. And, 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 and uh, um, I suspect that you also had this kind of encounter mm. of seeing Jesus forgiving these people while they are still doing it. Mm. He didn't even have a chance to first, you know, go through the trouble and then come back to it and look at it. And I, I, I would like to hear your, your perspective and how you, do you challenge people when it comes mm. forgiveness in a, in a vis a vis this, this, this story of Jesus. Mm. Um. I always uh, like to say that uh, uh, forgiveness uh, is, uh, is something that uh, is between you and God. Mm. Uh, I, believed, uh, I believe Jesus, what he was doing on the cross, he, he, he didn't want to, to have anything. Uh, he didn't want to die with, uh, with anyone in his heart because I always see unforgiveness as uh, holding someone in your heart. So I believe Jesus uh, had what we said earlier, that he, he knew, he saw beyond what they were doing. Uh, of course, for him, he was God, so he, he, saw, he saw them making uh, the prophecy come through. And, uh, but uh, when it comes to us, uh, forgiveness does not depend on the other person. And uh, as we will come back, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you a testimony of... Uh, uh, but. I don't know why I'm focusing today so much on the on the young generation. I don't I don't know why, but I've seen people who have uh, claimed or have blamed the government uh, for giving positions to the so-called uh, Hutu. Uh, but I believe everyone who is in that position is because they worked hard and they deserve they it. deserved it. Uh, but uh, when it comes to us forgiving people and uh, when we think they don't deserve it, we are forgiveness. Che it's for our benefit more than uh, the person, the offender. So, forgiveness sets you free, not the other person. So you are you are saying, I don't want this person to hurt me and prevent me to receive the forgiveness of God. And I want to end on this uh, on this scripture before we go in the break. Mm -hmm. It's one of the scriptures that uh, I'm in love with nowadays. It's in Psalms uh, 35. Uh, let me start from. Uh, verse 11 uh, they said they are witnesses trying to harm me they ask they ask me questions that I know nothing about uh, they pay me back evil for the good I have done mm -hmm. they make me very sad but when they are very sick when they were sick uh, I was sad and wore sacroth I went without eating to show my sorrow I mourned, I mourned for them as I, I would fo do for a friend or for a brother. I bound low with sadness, crying as I would do for my own mother. So as uh, I believe we are, we are talking to Christians, but also to Rwandans, we need to go beyond uh, the noble. We need to go beyond what we've been taught of hating those who hate us and harming those who have harmed us. But uh, we need to to worry about them. We need yeah. to to love them. Think about these guys who have been in prison for 30 years because of something they did, uh, not of their own choice, uh, but or something they did uh, without their full conscious mind. Uh, they are somewhere in prison because they were seen in a, in a crowd, mm -hmm. uh, because they joined in something they didn't know would end up like this. So as we pray, as we pray for the survivors, let's also pray for those who, who committed the sin because uh, they, they have also uh, things going on in their, in their mind and I don't want to imagine what's going on in their mind. Yeah. But uh, we need to, to pray for them that God will bring healing and comfort wherever they are. Yeah. So uh, before we take a break, I would like to end on these comments. Uh, I quote Antoine Taisei and he says, It was when it was the most difficult to forgive that Jesus prayed that prayer. It might be very difficult for you to forgive. Might be, you might be struggling, you might be asking yourself so many questions. But as a Christian, you are called to forgive even though it's tough. And he says some things, before, before he says that for true Christians, forgiveness is not an option, it's an order and it's to your advantage. He, he, he tells us the stories of people in the Bible mm. 
they were challenged to forgive and God enabled them to forgive. He says Moses prayed for his sister who was punished with, with leprosy for speaking against him. You go to Joseph hugging his brothers who had betrayed him and they had actually, they had actually killed him. It's just that <laughs> somehow God rescued him. Uh, he also talks about Jesus praying for his tormentor, tormentors. Stephen praying for those who stoned him. Paul play, praying for those who abandoned him when he went for his trial. And he says, for a true Christian, forgiveness is not just an option, it's an order and it's to your advantage. So, we're challenging Rwandans by especially Christians, challenge ourselves to forgive even when it is that hard, even when it is that difficult. And uh, we'll come back after the break and continue with the book, which is very interesting and we already thank you for having joined us. So let's meet in five minutes. So well, we all come back from the break uh, and we are still in the same spirit as uh, the artist was singing. We are looking forward to Rwanda. Uh, that we are already enjoying part of what he sang. I think that song was very prophetic. So we are still going, we are still looking forward to even a better Rwanda. We are still dreaming even a better Rwanda. And um, yeah, so that's part of why we are doing what we are doing. There's a, before we leave chapter 5, there's a, a short comment I would like to hear your view about. It's on page 58, just like a few pages after after the other, the other, the other, the other, uh, the other comments we are making. And it says, it's in paragraph 3, it says, I have had many people saying that when you come to Christ, you are a new creation and the old is gone. As if your awakened soul means wounds and bitterness will just disappear from your heart and your mind. I know this is a very big battle of, 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 of theologians and I would like to hear where you stand. Mm -hmm. Some say uh, as soon as you get saved, you are a new creation, the old is gone. Mm -hmm. uh, some, sort of, in a, in a, some sort of a kind of an automatic way. Mm -hmm. Others say uh, your spirit is reborn but your soul there's still a lot of things you've got to struggle with and some will even go to next and then they say if you struggle to forgive it means you haven't been saved yet if you're still struggling with some sins it means i haven't saved yet because there's mm -hmm. no possible way that we'll continue to desire to sin and continue to to live in bondage to sin if you were truly reborn or if you were truly born again so where do you stand on that debate um uh, first with the with the scripture itself uh saying that when we come to Jesus, we are a new creature, it's true. Uh, when we come to him, our old nature is, uh, uh, when we read the Bible, it says that our old nature is crucified with him. Uh, but uh, it's, our, it's our responsibilities uh, as those who bring people to, or those who preach to non-believers, to become believers, I think it's always good to, to help someone really become a new creature. Because this person, let's say, has been, uh, has been living for 30 years and now he has come to Jesus. Uh, he has a past. Uh, he has things that uh, has wounded him, him or her. So it's always, uh, I'll say, responsibility for preachers and pastors and uh, evangelists and any brother, any brethren in, in the Lord to help someone walk that journey. Um, this, you've been here and you're coming to a new kingdom. This is a kingdom where you have life, where you have peace, where there's love. But you can't ignore his past life. So you need to bring him through that journey of Telling him in this kingdom, uh, we apply forgiveness for you to be forgiven. In this kingdom, you need to confess your sins uh, to one another. In this kingdom, you need to uh, to confess things that you've been involved in, to expose the enemy's work uh, that you've been involved in. But if someone comes and confesses Jesus is Lord and uh, he believes in his heart, he will be saved. But that's why we have so many Christians who are struggling, not saying that they are not saved, they are saved. And uh, it's probably that they will even go to heaven, uh, uh, that one I'm not sure, but they are saved. Uh, but 
their wounds and uh, their past life is the reason why they can't uh, go straight and that's mm -hmm. the biggest problem the church has today and uh, that's a concern that pastors and evangelists and all the brothers and sisters in Christ need to take care of. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, because of the time, we are not going to make uh, longer comments on some of the sections of the book, uh, but it's this section, chapter 6, that I would like us to come back to. Uh, Pastor Antoine is... Uh, is is coming back on the on the principle that Jesus I think it's only Jesus that taught this principle of loving your enemies uh, in Matthew he challenges us that if we only love our friends then what difference do we make um, but so as even though he challenges us to love our enemies it's not that easy thing it's not an easy thing and on page 71 this is what Pastor Antoine has to say about it. He says, this page 71, paragraph 2. Mm. And he says, If you want to love your enemies, look behind the mask of hatred, cruelty, and violence they display on the outside. And you will always find a human face. And he says that he, he, he uh, uh, and I quote, And I often prayed this prayer which I still pr often pray today. Lord, help me to see beyond the appearances and help me to hear beyond the words. Uh, I know in so many ways you, you have also been challenged to love those who have hated you, those who have killed your family. Um, and you have really made some progress regarding that. Uh, what would you, what's your, what's your, What's your opinion? What what do you what what would you say about his statement or his kind of philosophy of saying that uh, uh, if you want to be able to love your enemies, you've got to look beyond their outside appearance, their actions, and find some humanity within them. That's something you can be able to relate with. What, what, what do you think? Mm. Um, it's a it's a good approach. Uh, me, well, well, one of one of the approaches that I've done is to to pray for them. Uh, to pray for them as I would pray for myself. Uh, I would say this is an exercise because you start praying, Lord bless them, uh, protect them, uh, the usual prayer that you would pray anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but you need to go, as you keep praying for them, you start even praying for, you go beyond protection, you, you go into their needs because some of them you know what they are going through, you pray for their children, you pray for their salvation. Uh, sometimes when you are still wounded, you don't even want to pray for them to be saved because uh, this guy will meet in heaven, but you need to go uh, beyond that. Uh, so it's an exercise. Um, I, I've seen an illustration of one person who was saying, if you push someone who has not who has been going to the gym, uh, there's nothing much that will happen because this person has been exercising. Uh, so when we keep exercising, even the, the next time they offend us, because you've been exercising, you've been trying to love them as much as you could, uh, you've been trying to bless them as the Word of God says. Uh, and as much as you bless them, as much as you pray for them, that's when you see the humanity in them. Because when you pray, you remember oh, this guy doesn't have a school fees. Lord bless him and provide for him the school fees. Uh, as you go beyond that, even them, they'll realize that and they'll start to smile. They'll start... Uh, 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 I have a story of a friend who approached me. Uh, his father was among the people who burnt my home during the genocide and uh, took some of the things that were in the house. So this guy, uh, I tried to be good to him. I tried uh, um, to speak uh, to my family for him when they were about to sell his house during the Gachacha court because that's some of what the Gachacha court did. It wasn't very successful, but he knew that I tried. So before my relationship with him, like when we used to play football, uh, I'd be very aware that he's he's on the on, on the pitch, 
so wherever they'll give me a ball and he could attack, I would give it away because I knew I didn't know what he had in mind. Mm -hmm. But the more I showed him that he's a normal person, the more I showed him love, he started opening up to me and started even telling me his own personal issues. So I think it's a, as I said, a reconciliation, as even um, Lee Quarren said, it's very hard. But if you want to reconcile with someone, you need to take an extra step. Uh, the, even the Bible says, if someone offends you, please go and find them uh, secretly, you know, not boasting about it and say, you know, uh, of me and, uh, but the Bible says approach them. It says, you who've been offended, take that step and talk to him so that you may win a, bro a brother back. So I think it's a, it's a very big responsibility, but uh, as we said, Jesus is our Lord, he's our commander, and he can't ask us something that doesn't have uh, a benefit for us. So he knows there's something very crucial about it. So I, I, I really, uh, there's, a, there's a testimony of his wife in the book that she, where she used to work, there were some people who were extremists and kept, uh, you know, offending her. But as, as much as it's a process, you are required as a Christian, as someone who really wants to have a reconciliation as your lifestyle, to keep exercising, to keep exercising by praying, blessing them, and uh, trying to see that humanity in them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you mentioned about sometimes when you're praying for them, and uh, and and feel like you don't want them to get saved, I remembered uh, 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 a portion that I read, and I pray or hope that once I meet Pastor Tuan, I'm going to ask him about what happened here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a story I think. Uh, it's in chapter, in chapter, um, well, we may not, not be able to get this chapter, it's in chapter 8. And he shares a story of what has happened to him. He says, um, I'm quoting, I always remember the day when one genocide survivor came to me and said, what, I do, what you're doing is betrayal. How do you dare, uh, how, how dare you preach to, these, to those murderers? Mm. Let them at least die in sin and go to hell. That's where they will get the right punishment for what they did to us. What if you preach to them and they repent and go to heaven? Mm -hmm. After all they did to our people. That was the question that they confronted him with. Mm -hmm. And somehow I feel like you kind of have gone through the same experience or have, uh, have had people that share with you the kind of experience. Well, I mean, what, um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you respond to such a person? Uh, I have a family member who used to go to a Catholic church, and wherever they'll say, give, uh, you know, they say, give each other the grace and the peace of God. So it's in the middle of the service, and you have to greet each other. Peace, may the peace of the Lord be with you. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Uh, wherever she will turn and find out that the face that is, she's about to give uh, the peace of the Lord is. Uh, is a face that she wouldn't <laughs> give uh, and she didn't want to lie in the sanctuary of the Lord and she would just pretend mm -hmm. and uh, give someone else the peace of the Lord but what does that mean? that means uh, you are killing yourself uh, you'll be judged according to how you are judged uh, the same measure yeah, the Bible goes on pressed down, shaken together uh, but you lose your freedom. There is that lack of freedom if you don't forgive. Uh, there is that lack of peace. Imagine being in the, in the house of God and you are like, uh, if you don't give him the peace of the Lord, he will not give you the peace of the Lord. And throughout the service you will be sitting, remembering that there is someone you refuse to greet sitting next to you. And the next of the service you will not follow. Um, so I believe uh, we need, <laughs> if, they get, if they get saved, to me, like the guy who killed my father, my prayer is that he, he gets saved <laughs> before he dies, then 
not only to go, so this me being honest uh, and showing you how much the benefit is not them going to heaven only. I believe if this guy was to receive Jesus in his life, then he would tell the truth and then he would tell us where the body of my father is because he's the only person who can tell us where they took uh, their bodies. Uh, but if he's still in anger and hatred and he's still being as stubborn as he is, uh, I don't think he will ever say what we need the most. Uh, this is an information that my whole family will be glad to know uh, when others are in April, when others are going to to put some flowers or to commemorate it. I think it's something good to mourn for your loved ones. Uh, you see, when he's still in the kingdom of darkness, mm -hmm. he's hiding an information that may be great, may be helpful, helpful to me. But if he receives Jesus, he will confess, and he will he will be useful to me now, because he can do worse than what he did. So all all I can pray for him now is to get saved, so that. That it may be having the same information for many families. So I'm trying to show you the benefit that we can get if these guys get saved in a in a tangible way. But beyond that, he has a purpose that God has created him for. I don't think he was created to commit genocide. I believe there are more things that he was created for. So if he gets saved, God will reveal to him uh, his purpose on the earth and they will fulfill it and his purpose will benefit many people. So we need to to pray for them. We need to yeah to to really have mercy on them because they are going through a terrible torment time. Yeah. I think um, we will end on chapter seven, but before I go into chapter seven I think part of what I would comment on uh, what he just said uh, of the, the tangible benefits of praying for the for these perpetrators, mm -hmm. you, has, you mentioned that they could reveal information that they are still keeping mm -hmm. a secret. Yet it is very open information. But I also think uh, when you were mentioning that, I also thought of of their children. I mm -hmm. think uh, some of these people, there are those who are in prisons, but there are those who are not in prisons who are still in homes, their homes and uh, they may not be feeding their children the right kind of thinking and attitude. Mm -hmm. Some might even be in prison, but maybe their mothers are home and we don't know what they're teaching their children. We don't know the kind of future future that they, 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 are, they are giving the Rwanda. But if we pray for them and they get saved, I think we kind of have a better chance at, uh, look, at seeing our nation really. Because as soon as they I, I believe that when, when they are saved, also what they feed their children in terms of philosophy and thinking changes. Instead of continuing to teach hatred, they start to teach love. So uh, I can agree with you that there is a lot of benefits if these perpetrators uh, get saved. Yeah, so, and, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, even what we are talking about today, about reconciliation and all that, uh, reconciliation happens when both parties agree to forgive and be forgiven and be reconciled. Uh, even us, if Jesus forgave us 2,000 years ago, but if we don't acknowledge that forgiveness and come back to him and say, Lord, we acknowledge that you are God and you are our Savior, forgive us our sins and our trespasses, uh, we are not reconciled with the Father as much as God has forgiven us. And mm -hmm. So reconciliation needs the other person. So unless, as we said, it's by the grace of God that this person admits what he has done and uh, chooses to repent, then reconciliation becomes very hard. But if this person humbles himself, receives Jesus Christ and receives the grace of God, uh, then reconciliation is easy. Because when he comes to you in repenting, uh, though we we have forgiven them even before they ask for forgiveness but i think it's good if they do ask uh, if they do their part in the reconciliation process and then we can say that we have fully 
reconciled, the country is fully reconciled because even the perpetrators have repented and asked for forgiveness. And those who have been offended have been have forgiven them and they have reconciled. That's, I think, that's the full version of, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of reconciliation. Yeah. All right, all right. Um, the time is not really on our side. Uh, we would like to end with chapter 7 uh, in the few minutes that we are left with. And uh, we may not even complete chapter 7, but we, of course, uh, uh, we will have a time to come back and cover the rest of, uh, of the chapters. And uh, what I would want us to conclude from uh, is a portion, because many times when we are talking about forgiveness and reconciliation in our context of the 1994 genocide against Tutsi, we, we, we keep on looking at uh, the perpetrators and genocide survivors. And uh, sometimes, but not all times, of course, uh, I've also had people talk about how they were able to forgive beyond the perpetrators of the genocide and one group of people that we've got to forgive also uh, is those who have sown the seeds of hatred and that's the 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 the, 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 the colonizers the Belgians as we mentioned mm -hmm. and also those who watched over when the the, the, the the killings were going on and in chapter 7 where I would like to finish from on page 88 Pastor Antoine reflects on the peacemakers uh, and this is what he says he says of course I'm picking a portion in a big in a big paragraph and he says mm -hmm. uh, instead uh, uh, maybe let me start from uh, a little bit upper he says from the beginning of the killing people had died in front of that camp and the soldiers on lookout positions had not even moved the few meters across the road to secure those who were being massacred. This was not part of their mandate either. Instead, their mandate, and I want you to uh, comment about this, he says, instead their mandate was to be peacekeepers, not peacemakers. Maybe it makes sense that Christ called us to be peacemakers and not peacekeepers. Mm -hmm. and he says that instead their mandate was to be peacekeepers, not peacemakers. They were not here to protect us just observe how we died. Mm -hmm. The world had not only given us over to death, they had cynically deployed people and paid them to observe how we would die. So I would like to hear your comment about the international community and the, the people were in Rwanda, but also uh, you look at this comment and you know there's an issue here. There's also uh, a chance and an opportunity to forgive the international community because when you say this you kind of like saying i expected these people mm. to protect us mm. but they didn't obviously there is a lot of lessons to learn and i think the biggest lesson we've learned from from expecting the international community is is the kinwanda saying mm. or the rescue from the outside will only come late mm. that's one side but the other side is uh, when you have been wronged when you have gone through uh through this devastation um i think part of the people the groups of people or the people that we are going to forgive is also the international community so i would like to hear what, what you got to say about the international community and their role in the genocide but also um have you also uh gone through the process of forgiving them what would you say to someone who still finds them uh finds himself harboring some hatred thoughts for, for what they contributed in the mm -hmm. genocide because um, as we all know Rwandans even though they had had these social classes for a very long period of time there had never been a conflict between Hutus and Tutsis in Rwanda until the colonizers came mm -hmm. so in one way or the other they are sort of a source mm -hmm. what has what's happening we do not put all the blame all, all, all the responsibility on them mm -hmm. because we Rwandans <laughs> turned against each other and that's not the responsibility that we're going to run away from mm -hmm. but we can also we cannot also uh, shun our eyes from their role and their responsibility mm -hmm. so yeah uh, what are your thoughts about that and 
how if you have also faced and confronted the issue of forgiving them how have you even been able to do it mm. what would you say to somebody who is struggling with forgiving them um, yeah um, regarding the international community I think uh, to me I always see it in this way of uh, um, I bring back the blame to to us as the uh, people of Rwanda to have had so much expectation uh, for, for these guys. Um, if you look at the history of Rwanda, uh, we have always been the ones to solve our own problems. Um, someone who still struggles to forgive the international community, uh, I think they have not come to that understanding of saying Rwanda's problem is Rwanda's problem. And I think those are the people who still uh, look for, for solution uh, into, from the international community. They are not all bad, but uh, I really encourage Rwandese to, to forgive what happened, for the division they brought since the uh, 1990, uh, 1919, I think that's when uh, the Belgian took over and chose to forgive them for the division and what they brought in our country. And also, um, what for overlooking uh, the killings in, the, in 1994. But also, if you, like if you read the, a book of uh, Darel, or no Darel, uh, so, yeah, you find out that their approach, the the seniors, what they were saying, it was like it's two groups uh, killing each other. So it's it's like a family. <laughs> I've always had people telling me that never get involved into family family conflicts. family issues because they uh, uh, turn back to you. So uh, I think we should stop moving the blame. Uh, and bring it back and own our own uh, our own fault. Um, of course, there are people who are very wounded. Someone who saw uh, them going with the dogs and leaving the babies. Uh, f for that person, it's a very special uh, image that they have in their mind. But I, I plead with you, uh, if you are struggling to forgive the international community, please uh, choose to forgive and let go because uh, we need to build the Rwanda and no one else will build our country uh, unless uh, we do it ourselves and we can't do that when we offended people. So they did what they did, but we need to move on. Uh, and I, I, that's my recommendation even to our neighboring countries. Uh, don't have too much hope into uh, the international community, the international community uh, but try to resolve your problem. As we always say, ignore uh, Ishachirinzira. Um, let's be the Randis that so solve our own solve problems. Our own problems. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, obviously, we, we are not able to complete the book, and uh, we're looking forward to have another session where we can complete the book. Uh, but I know that somehow what we have covered so far may resonate with a lot of people. and. Uh, I know it's your passion, uh, your passion has to do with forgiveness, reconciliation, young people and all that. Maybe it might be that some of our viewers or people who watch this, the, 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 this talk show might want to contact you. And uh, even though you had earlier mentioned your, your handles, your social media handles, I uh, would like you to repeat, to, to kind of uh, again uh, mention them and uh, you know, some people might want to come into your inbox and ask questions and maybe they might need help, maybe they might need a prayer. And uh, once you've done giving us your contacts, you can also uh, pray for us as we close the, the, the talk show for today. So I'd like to thank you, first of all, for having chosen to uh, join our conversation. Um, as I had just said, we, we are not able to complete the, the book because we didn't want to rush things and just finish the book, but not tackling some of these issues. And we look forward to have another session. We pray to God that God will help us also have more and I mean uh, dig deeper into the book. God willing, we might have a chance to have a conversation with uh, with the author of the book and also ask him some of the questions that we may not be able to find the answers. And again, we 
still encourage you to find the time and uh, invest some resources and buy the book. It is very rich. It is very wealthy. Wealthy. Is it called wealthy or something like that? It's very rich. Uh, buying it will be worth every cent you pay on the book. So, uh, invite you for our next session uh, that we might have this coming Sunday. Or if it is not this coming Sunday, but we definitely have, we'll have another session that covers the rest of the content. So, thank you so much for viewing, for, for, for choosing to join our conversation. And thank you, Bruno, for having chosen to share your deep stories. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to more. Thank you so much, uh, uh, As I asked, uh, you can follow me on uh, Iradukunda Bruno uh, 25 on Instagram uh, and Iradukunda Bruno Kavanda on Facebook, uh, Iradukunda Bruno on Twitter and uh, uh, X now. And uh, you can also reach us on the number on your screen uh, in case you want uh, more information about what we do and uh, in case you want uh, to hear more from us. And may God be really bless you for taking your time to listen to us. So let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for, for this amazing time and we thank you for, uh, for Antoine uh, for blessing him and protecting him and for such an amazing story that he writes on his book. Father, we pray that he may continue to, to bless him, protect him in his retirement. The Lord continue to reveal more things to him and thank you for making him a blessing to this country. We pray for our country. Let reconciliation be uh, the tie that unites all Randis and all the people all over the world because people have been offended in one way or another. But we pray that people learn from us, we learn from the country, we learn from our history and be united, forgive and reconcile for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.